Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, we're all really excited to have Dr. Fiona Harrison here. Um, she's a professor at Caltech uh, studying energetic phenomena, um, everything from gamma ray bursts and black holes to neutron stars and supernova. Um, the reason we're here tonight is because she leads the Caltech New Star Science Team. Um, and we're gonna hear more about that project later. Um, but she has, uh, right, she studies generally um, optics, you know, these high energy phenomena in the solar system and other things. Um, you know, she, she's a standout in the field and has received numerous awards uh, from the Presidential Early Career Award, NASA's Outstanding Public Leadership Award, uh, Bruno Rossi, Prize of uh, the American Ast Astronomical Society, uh, and the Macy Award of COSPAR, among several others. Um, outside of research, right, uh, she uh, enjoys skiing, hiking, music, travel with her husband and kids. Um, and so with that out of the way, I hope you're all really excited for this talk um, and to hear more about New Star. So please help me welcome Dr. Harrison to the podium. Well, it's great to be able to give this uh, talk because it's a very special year. It's 10 years since we launched New Star. Uh, and I had lunch with the project manager who, from JPL who saw New Star through development. And he was reminding me yesterday that I said, Yunjin, I'm not gonna be happy unless this mission lasts 10 years. He goes, it's not gonna last 10 years. It'll, I give you five at most, but here we are. So uh, what I'm gonna tell you about is uh, New Star, uh, both the science and the art, and I'll tell you what I mean by art in a minute, but New Star is, uh, was the very first high energy X-ray telescope to truly focus. And that means that compared to previous instruments operating in the same energy band, uh, it can achieve sensitivities Fact and uh, angular resolution factors of 100 or more uh, better than any previous mission. It's also a small explorer, which means they're PI-led, and uh, it's NASA's smallest astrophysics standalone platform. And people ask me, how small is small? Well, 120 million, uh, not including the uh, launch vehicle. Sounds like a lot of you work in ground, on the ground, but in space, uh, it is a constrained mission. And so I want to share my some of my favorite highlights from the science, but also the art of building uh, New Star. There are people in this room who uh, worked really hard on the team to put New Star together and launching something that was very, very ambitious on this small constrained platform took some creativity, and that's what I am calling the art. So I want to start with a big picture. This is a public lecture, and I just want to remind everybody that we do truly live in a golden age of astronomy. And I'll uh, look back to the time in the 90s when I was in graduate school. At that time, we didn't know the age of the universe to a factor of two. We argued about it. Today, we're arguing about the second decimal place. We know it's 13.77 billion years old. Uh, we also, at that time, when I was a student, uh, didn't know about dark matter. There were little hints. But we now know that the vast majority of matter that creates gravity that shapes the galaxies uh, and matter in the universe into filaments so that it can then uh, form stars is shaped by this dark matter. We also didn't know about dark energy, which when you look at the energy density of the universe, uh, it's 74% of the energy density. We didn't know it existed, and we now know it's shaping the uh, final state, uh, the final uh, end to the universe. So how did our view of the universe change so fundamentally in less than a generation? Um, it really is through technological advances in detectors and optics combined with access to space. 
And this enabled us, uh, for the first time, to view the heavens across the electromagnetic spectrum. So in microwaves, which are emitted uh, from a region very early, just 400,000 years after the Big Bang, that enabled some of those amazing measurements that I told you about, the constraints on the age of the universe and uh, dark matter, to infrared light, which is emitted by the some of the first galaxies. It's what we experience as heat, right? So warm matter. We can view back to the early universe because of the redshift. Uh, and Spitzer and now James Webb uh, are, gave us uh, are, and are giving us uh, an amazing view uh, of the infrared universe. And then, of course, the optical uh, and ultraviolet, which enables us to study nearby galaxies uh, in great detail. So what do all these uh, emissions, microwaves, infrared, uh, optical x-rays have in common? Well, they're all electromagnetic radiation. Uh, they, it's the same fundamental phenomenon, which never ceases to amaze me, uh, differing only in the wavelength. So when we look at the microwave, all right, that's got a wavelength the size of humans, to the infrared, to the X-ray. So X-ray radiation is fundamentally the same phenomenon as, as optical light, all right, just a different wavelength. And I also want to point out that if we think of thermal emission from objects in the universe, the dominant wavelength that they radiate is at is related to their temperature. So when we're talking about cold material that radiates in, in the microwave, uh, when we're talking about very hot material, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of degrees Kelvin, that will radiate in the X-ray. So if we want to view the full range of matter, of states, of temperatures in the universe, we need to cover uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. So I mentioned access to space. Why is that so crucial? Well, this, this is actually inverted from the last plot I showed, so sorry about that. Radio is on this side, and X-ray and gamma ray is here. But it just shows you that it's only a very narrow window in the optical and uh, near ultraviolet, and then in the radio, where we can actually observe the cosmos using telescopes from space. Every other wavelength, from the UV, X-ray, gamma ray, uh, to many portions of the infrared, you need to get above the atmosphere. So of course, uh, that is why our eyes evolve to see in the visible. OK, so now you know. So uh, this, was, this picture was actually sent to me by my good friend Bob Kirshner, who's a well-known astrophysicist. Uh, but now you know, x-rays are just simply electromagnetic uh, light with sort of angstrom scale wavelengths. They don't have magical cleansing properties. And I'm about to tell you that you can't detect them with these glasses. You need very uh, specialized uh, optics and detectors. So I'm now going to focus on this view of the electromagnetic spectrum expanding to really look at the x-ray band. Okay, So the x-ray band. Uh, for the uh, lay people in the audience, we characterize by an energy of the x-rays. Uh, and don't worry about the units, but between 0.1 and 100 units of KeV are uh, defined as an x-ray band. And below 10 KeV, just remember the number 10, uh, both NASA and ESA have flown incredibly powerful focusing x-ray telescopes. Uh, like the Chandra Observatory you may have heard about, or XMM-Newton. However, above 10 kiloelectron volts, until New Star, there was no sensitive X-ray mission. The, the uh, cameras were based on pinhole camera technology, which is inherently very insensitive and doesn't have good uh, angular resolution. And so what we did for New Star was really develop the capability to focus, to make a real telescope in this high energy uh, X-ray band. So I'm going to make an analogy here. It's a little simplistic, but um, just to sort of get across what you gain 
by adding different colors of X-ray light. So it's, this is an analogy to the visible. This is a star-forming galaxy called Antennae. And if you look at it in black and white, right, you get a general sense of the morphology. But if you look at it in red uh, colors, what you see is where all the dust and uh, the dust is, right, in shrouding star-forming regions. And then when you add the highest energy, uh, blue and optical light, then suddenly out come the energetic star-forming regions. And so you get a lot more information uh, when you can break down uh, the emission into colors. And that, by analogy, is what we do with New Star. So New Star uses the same energy x-rays to observe the universe as your doctor and dentist use uh, and uh, to image your teeth and bones. And so what New Star is seeing by exploiting this wave band is some of the hottest, densest, most energetic uh, regions in the universe. And so what I'm showing here is a montage of actual uh, New Star data overlaid. Here's an overlay with low energy x-ray data. This is the New Star uh, image of, for a supernova remnant highlighting uh, the very energetic regions, uh, same here. So what we're able to do is pick out uh, the most energetic sources, the sources where particles are accelerated very close to the speed of light. Uh, and we can do this in objects uh, ranging from our own sun uh, to black, uh, the regions around black holes and the remnants of uh, exploded stars. And the other thing I want to mention is high energy x-rays are also very penetrating, unlike low energy x-rays. So they can penetrate through a lot of dust and gas, and we can observe re regions in the universe that otherwise would be invisible. So being able to focus these high-energy x-rays took a lot of technology development, both new kinds of x-ray detectors that were developed down here in the labs in the basement of Cahill, uh, and new kinds of focusing optics. So x-rays are very hard to focus, and high-energy x-rays are especially hard to focus, and I won't go into that. You can ask me afterwards why, but uh, we had to build very complex optics. Uh, and then we also assembled a lot of the electronics. And what was great about this is, is the students and postdocs had the opportunity to actually hands-on work with the hardware, calibrate it, and say they helped uh, build a space mission. So it was about 15 years from when we started the first serious technology development to launch and about four years to actually build the mission. So this picture here shows the spacecraft here with the instrument here, uh, all assembled at, at that time it was called Orbital Sciences in Dulles, Virginia. Um, now bought out by Northrop Grumman. Uh, and then we shipped the uh, observatory to Vandenberg Air Force Base, where we integrated it with the rocket. So this shows x-ray mirrors, you can see here, uh, all being tucked away in the shroud. Now, it's a very unusual launch that we used for New Star. It's a small mission. We had to use a small and expensive launch vehicle. Uh, and this is called a Pegasus. Uh, so this is a, a rocket that fits under the belly of an L-1011 aircraft. You're probably mostly too young to remember the L-1011. Uh, uh, and so the whole payload fits in this compact shroud here, and then this is the rocket part. And then the, the uh, airplane took off, flew to Kwajalein uh, Island, in the South uh, Pacific for launch. And the reason we wanted to go to the South Pacific was not for the palm trees, but we wanted to go around the equator where there's very low particle backgrounds um, that mimic x-rays. So I'm actually gonna show you a movie of what the launch looks like. This is not New Star's launch. New Star launched at night, so we needed, we couldn't actually see it. But this, it's kinda cool. Don't ask me. Anyway. So the plane takes off, goes to 30,000 feet, the rocket drops for five seconds, ignites, and then actually launches in front of the airplane. 
up to about 660 kilometers where it goes into free fall around the Earth. So, you know, people always say the launch is the scariest moment. I, yeah, I wasn't particularly concerned, but uh, Dave Thompson, who is the CEO, was the CEO of Orbital Sciences, was a friend of mine, and uh, he said, well, you know, I don't, op you know, this is very rare, but if you want, you can ride in the airplane for the launch. <laughs> and I said, are you kidding? Take off with a ton of solid explosive underneath? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so I was actually in mission operations at UC Berkeley. This is the actual new star launch. It's an infrared camera. I said we launched at night and the rocket is warm and so we could take a picture of it. Uh, and uh, so we were able to also see all the telemetry. It was a picture-perfect launch. Um, this, my group was in uh, Hamitman here. So anyway, it was a, it was a picture-perfect launch, and actually, I, uh, I wasn't actually worried about the launch, because I figured it was going to go up or it was going to go down. There was nothing I could do about it. And, but I was worried about what had to happen 14 days after launch. So if you were astute, you notice that shroud underneath the airplane is pretty short. And when, if you look at this picture of, or this model of New Star, it's long, right? So how did that work? Well, 14 days after launch, we sent a command to the instrument to uh, deploy. Anyway, so we sent this command, and about 10,000 piece parts uh, made of Tinker Toy-like structure uh, started to deploy and lock in place bay by bay, 52 bays. Uh, these are carbon fiber and those are uh, steel cables. And this, the Mars people talk about their seven minutes of terror. This was 24 minutes of terror because I actually knew one, it hadn't always deployed properly on the ground. And two, we never fully deployed it uh, with fully assembled because it was just too dangerous. You couldn't offload gravity well enough. But it all worked perfectly, and uh, New Star has been on orbit since, viewing the high energy sky. And I'll just point out there are two co-aligned X-ray telescopes just to get collecting area. All right, so we just add the images, focusing on two detectors. So there are consequences of flying a slinky where you should have an optical bench, and that is that it moves around, and so we have a laser metrology system that's constantly measuring the motion and taking it out so that we can make crisp images of uh, the X-ray sky like never have been seen before. And I just want to give you a qualitatively, uh, qualitative feel for what a big advance New Star uh, was. So this is an image made by one of those pinhole camera technology uh, telescopes that I told you about that are not very sensitive. These, this is centered on uh, the heart of our galaxy where there's a supermassive black hole. This is about two times the diameter of the sun by four times the diameter of the sun. And these are big, these are point sources, they're big just because the optics are very blurry. This is new stars image of the region right centered on Sagittarius A star where the black hole is. And for the first time, we were able to see that there's actually a high energy diffuse glow, which we now believe uh, is caused by a large collection of dead stars called white dwarfs. They're not resolved. That's hence the reason that it looks uh, diffuse. And so this was a, a new discovery. This was one of our first observations, okay? And we, of course, like to, uh, we like to uh, advertise uh, our results to the public. 
And so we had a press release on this, and th this is how the press picked it up. It didn't hurt that it was around Halloween time that we uh, released this result. But it was also one of the top 10 space uh, stories in Astronomy Magazine of 2016. So pretty good for a, a small explorer mission. All right, so now I'm going to tell you about New Star's observation of black holes. And I would argue this is one of the areas where we've made uh, some of the largest advances by studying the regions very uh, close to both stellar mass or, uh, black holes and supermassive black holes. So just to remind some of you and, and uh, tell uh, the public that a black hole, astrophysical black holes are actually pretty simple. They're characterized by a mass and by a spin, right? And uh, they're tears in the fabric of sp space time. There's an event horizon uh, from uh, within which nothing can escape. Uh, including light. This is a, a simulation of what the event horizon of a non-spinning black hole would look like if you could resolve it. Now you've probably seen the event horizon telescope images. There's two black holes where we can actually resolve the shadow of those, but otherwise we can't really observe black holes directly. Um, we have to uh, observe them indirectly by looking at the material that's around them. So I'm going to tell you about uh, the advances New Star has made in being able to measure the spin of black holes. All right. So how do you measure the spin if you can't actually resolve it? Uh, the spin is basically a, um, an angular momentum or a rotational energy that's uh, captured within the black hole. Well, black holes uh, don't live in isolation. They live in galaxies, in large part, that are full of dust and gas. They have gravity, so the gravity attracts the dust and gas towards the black hole. It organizes itself, typically, into a, a disk-like structure called an accretion disk. As it spirals in, friction uh, converts the gravitational energy into heat, and so when you get very close to the black hole, the material gets very hot. And uh, in these regions, particles get accelerated close to the speed of light, and it's that process uh, that creates uh, x-rays, and in particular, high-energy x-rays. So what I'm going to tell you now is how we use uh, the x-ray measurements to discern the spin of black holes. So this is an artist's rendition of the region near uh, a black hole. It's not distorted by gravitational effects, so this is what if, you know, uh, it would look like if you could take those out. You have the black hole, you have this accretion disk, and then I mentioned there's regions where particles are accelerated very close to the speed of light, and those regions uh, radiate uh, high-energy x-rays, and so you can think of them as kind of an x-ray flashlight shining down on the accretion disk, all right? And so the, this uh, high energy x-ray emission reflects off the accretion disk and then is collected by our telescope. And it's this reflected emission uh, that we can use in order to uh, measure the spin of a black hole. So how does this work? Well, if a black hole is not rotating, then uh, there's a minimum st uh, stable orbit and material can't um, rotate stably within this orbit, so it plunges into the black hole. If the uh, black hole is spinning, however, and in, in the same direction that the material is uh, spiraling in, then the disk, the innermost stable orbit is much smaller, the disk can come in much closer, all right? And you can tell this in the X-ray spectrum. Uh, if I look here, this is, uh, if we break the X-rays up into colors, all right, uh, and plot the intensity of those colors. So this is 10 keV here. I told you that was, we've not had focusing telescopes above that. This is emission from iron. And you can see it looks very different in the case of the non-spinning black hole uh, as compared to the spinning black hole uh, because of the effects of the rapid uh, rotation and, and the 
gravitational uh, redshift effects of the black hole. Now you would say, oh, well, wait a minute. So this looks very different, and that's observable below 10 keV. So why didn't previous uh, telescopes, uh, why were they not able to make this measurement? Well, there's a trick, okay? And that is, you, if you just look at low energy below 10 keV, you can mimic uh, the effects of the smeared emission that you would get from gravitational distortion by having a lot of dust and gas that's partially absorbing the x-rays. And you can get uh, exactly the same kind of smeared uh, spectrum. And so you really can't tell the difference. And this was a source of much debate at many x-ray astronomy conferences. A lot of uncivil discourse uh, resulted from this particular argument. But if you have high energies, right, the spectra, the emission looks very different, all right? Uh, in this case, you get a very prominent excess. In this case, you don't. So this was a measurement uh, that New Star uh, has now been able to make in many uh, supermassive and stellar mass black holes. But one of our first observations, where we first kind of recognized the potential, was of a supermassive black hole uh, in the heart of the galaxy NGC six, uh, 1365. And we happened to have a coordinated campaign with XMM-Newton, this ESA's X-ray telescope, and New Star together. And we looked did a very long uh, observation. And the reason we wanted to look at this particular system is it's known to have a lot of dust and gas. And we wanted to basically look at the effects of this dust and gas. So. Uh, when we uh, got the data, I was working with a colleague from Italy, and uh, we decided to meet at a conference uh, that we were both going to uh, in Greece. And you know, he had the XMM data, I had the New Star data. And so he showed me his spectrum first. So this is a model, okay? This red model is if there's a lot of dust and gas. This green model is if you actually have a rapidly spinning black hole where the disk is coming very close. And these blue points are the data from XMM at low energies. And he said, I basically can't tell the difference. So I actually had uh, the new star spectrum. And literally, this is true. It's kind of one of those things that happen very rarely. I pulled out the spectrum, and we overlaid them. And here was the result. This is the new star data, very clearly indicating that what we were seeing was a rapidly spinning uh, 4 million solar mass black hole. So once again, you know, we had a press release because we believe in explaining our results to the public. And so after we had this press release, I got a call from a reporter who said, well, you never said how fast in miles per hour the black hole's spinning. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a difficult question because black holes have no fiducial marks. You can't actually measure that speed. It's kind of a meaningless concept. And I said, well, <laughs> how fast is it going in rotations per minute? And I said, well, that's kind of a meaningless concept because blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and I said, well, how about this? OK, rotating black holes drag the fabric of space and time around with them. So if I were an observer near the horizon of the black hole observed from infinity, I would have to rotate 15 times per hour just to stand still. And the person said, that doesn't sound very fast. So I said, well, how about this? Spinning black holes uh, store energy. And if I grabbed the black hole and stopped it, that would release enough energy to unbind all the matter in the entire galaxy. And that's what led to the doomsday black hole story in space.com. <laughs> OK, so now we're going to switch topics. Uh, and I have just enough time to tell you about our first journal cover. OK, so this is the Sedona Journal of Emergence. This is actually a new star image. And this was my postdoc at the time, now a staff scientist, found this in Roman's bookstore. Uh, and if you probably can't read this, but what it says is, this new view 
of the supernova remnant Cassiopeia A, located 11,000 light years away, was taken by NASA. Inside, Cassiopeia speaks through Robert Shapiro. And I don't know what Cassiopeia said, because I didn't read the article, but I will tell you uh, about another um, really unique uh, measurement that New Star made. And that is of the remnants of the explosions of massive stars. So you probably, you may know that in the early universe, right after the Big Bang, we had a homogeneous soup of, of hydrogen, pro protons and electrons. And over the course of the evolution of the universe, as galaxies and stars uh, form, and massive stars then uh, burn all their nuclear fuel and explode, it's those uh, furnaces that create all of the elements like carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Uh, and it's, they're synthesized in the cores of stars. The stars explode and distribute them uh, throughout the cosmos where they can form uh, new stars and planets and uh, eventually life. So this just shows you uh, pictorially what happens towards the end of a massive star's life. It's burned its core mostly to iron. And once the core becomes iron, you can't create energy anymore through nuclear fusion, okay? So what happens is gravity takes over, the uh, star collapses, it bounces, and then explodes, distributing all of this material and leaving a, a remnant which glows for hundreds of years uh, afterwards in optical and x-ray. So uh, what has been a challenge, however, is to understand the mechanism by which stars explode. We know it's a ubiquitous phenomenon, but uh, many uh, complicated simulations fail to actually make stars explode. It's uh, very hard to take something that's uh, imploding, right, and make it explode. And so you have to add uh, asymmetries, you have to add uh, in new ingredients um, in order to successfully make stars uh, explode on a computer. And one of those ingredients is shown here. It's essentially an instability uh, called the standing accretion shock. And what happens is it, it results in, in a, a large scale turbulence, essentially sloshing of, of the star, which adds uh, energy through PDV work uh, and helps, uh, and also makes the material hang around uh, for longer in the regions where it can really get uh, accelerated. And so uh, this would imprint a shape on the supernova explosion that looks uh, something like that. It's not a unique mechanism though. Other people have pr proposed that if you have rapidly rotating stars, there's a rotational instability that can make stars explode and that would have a very different shape uh, geometry to it. It would be elongated along uh, an axis. So we can hope to try to uh, constrain these models by looking at the supernova remnants. So th th these are beautiful images from low energy x-ray telescopes, Chandra uh, in large part, of the what remains after a hundred to up to a thousand years after the explosion. All right. And you can look at the shape of these and say, well, maybe you can discern something about the mechanism that uh, made the stars explode. It's kind of like a crime scene investigator, right? The bomb explodes and you go look at the shrapnel and try to tell what the <laughs> explosion mechanism was. Uh, however, um, if you look at low energy x-rays, all right, these, uh, what happens is that, you know, material is expelled, there's a shock that heats up the material and makes it glow, all right? But it's all the outer layers of the star. It's not the core where the action is happening. And so if you look at Cassiopeia A, all right, 
in iron as measured at low energies by Chandra, you get something that looks kind of blobby that might lead you to believe that one of these uh, sort of sloshing mechanism, for lack of a better term, <laughs> was at play. However, if you look at silicon magnesium, it looks very elongated, just like that uh, rotational instability that I showed you. So what New Star was able to add was uh, the ability to view radioactive material. So in low energy x-rays, you're seeing heated, hot material expelled from the outer layers of the star, but very close to the central engine, close to the dividing line between what falls back you know, onto a, a compact remnant like a black hole or a new star, neutron star that remains from the core, and what gets expelled out, you create radioactive material. And one element, titanium-44, is pr a particularly good tracer. It's produced very close in, close to this dividing line. And uh, when you have radioactivity, you're not seeing hot thermal emission. You're seeing the transition of one element to another element, in this case, titanium to calcium. And you emit gamma rays in this process. Uh, some of these gamma rays are directly in the new star uh, energy band, right? And so by observing these, we can actually view the heart of the explosion. And this has never been done before. Uh, and so New Star's image of Cassiopeia A is here. You can see it is not elongated um, uh, like the outer layers might uh, low energy x-rays from the outer layers might lead you to believe, all right? And uh, work has been done now trying to understand this distribution. It leads very strongly towards models where you have this instability, large-scale convective, you know, large-scale turbulence uh, that exploded the star. So uh, that was one of my favorite results because we worked really, really hard to make the detectors have very good energy resolution to be able to make this measurement. The other thing I love about this uh, measurement is the following. This is sort of captures science, all right? So this shows you New Star's radioactive measurement in blue with uh, laid on top of Chandra's iron emission and the magnesium and calcium. And I can remember giving talks about making this measurement before New Star's launch and being told very confidently by theorists that I was wasting my time because everybody knew that the titanium would track exactly the iron. But, you know, I asked my then six-year-old daughter who said, so is a blue the same as a red? She's like, I don't think so, Mom. Uh, so we were able to do this. Uh, Unfortunately, there's not a lot of young remnants in the galaxy that are both young enough and, and bright enough uh, to do this. But we were able to measure the titanium from supernova 1987A, which is in a satellite galaxy, uh, one of the most famous supernova explosions because it happened so close in, and in 1987. And we couldn't actually resolve it, but we were able to uh, measure the velocities uh, of the ejecta and show that, again, it was showing these kind of large-scale asymmetries. So there are two remnants in which we could make this measurement. And this was another one of the top 10 space uh, science stories in 2016. So again, not bad for 120 million. Uh, and so I think in order to leave 15 minutes for questions, I will wrap up just by telling you that these are my, some of my favorite results that we predicted, we would, measurements we predicted we would make before launch. But what's been the most fun is the things we didn't predict. And uh, I know, you know, if you'd said New Star will make important measurements of the magnetosphere of Jupiter, I would have said, really? <laughs> or, uh, prove that some of the brightest 
X-ray sources in nearby galaxies that everybody has been arguing are black holes and, in fact, 100 solar mass black holes, in fact, were not at all. They're measly little 1.4 solar mass neutron stars because we could detect pulsations. Never, I remember announcing that at a conference and it was, it was just gasps, right? Like, uh, all those papers I wasted my time on, really? Uh, so, you know, now, 10 years after launch, um, New Star is almost 100% a guest uh, observer facility. So anybody, you can write a proposal to get New Star time. Uh, the team basically planned all the observations for the first two years and then handed it over uh, to the community. And it's been really fun to see the creativity uh, that people have brought to bear things like looking at the sun and things that we uh, didn't anticipate doing. This shows the group uh, 10 years after launch and with our surf students and uh, we had a big celebration. It helps to have Italian collaborators. So hint, get European collaborators, especially from Italy, because we were able to have a 10-year anniversary conference in Sardinia. <laughs> Highly recommended. Uh, and th this, is, this is the poster from that. And so it's been a great 10 years. Uh, I told my project manager yesterday that uh, I was anticipating 10 more. He said, forget it. But we'll see. <laughs> <laughs>